This sermon was recorded at the Church of Christ Northwest Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 1708 Elm Springs Road in Springdale, Arkansas. Uh, it's a blessing to be with you all this morning. Good to be home. Uh, I feel like we've just kind of, I uh, know we were gone last uh, Sunday and it was a good trip. I'm happy to report that it, it went really well and we got to connect with the brothers and sisters up there and looking forward to more opportunities for that. So keep praying for that work. But we're, it's good to be home. Um, of course, we're going to be gone next Sunday and then uh, the Sunday after that. But, um, but we'll, we'll, uh, we're glad to be here today and excited for the singing. It's going to be a good day. Um, as far as the, the sermon this morning, we're going to talk about repentance. Uh, this is an important subject that every Christian needs to know, every Christian needs to understand, because we all have repentance uh, that we need to be producing in our lives. And so this morning, we're going to talk about how to truly repent. That's probably one of the, if not the most central theme of the scriptures for us, is repentance. You know, think about the story of the Bible, and it's just the most incredible and beautiful story ever told. God, a holy God, created man to be holy like him, and we failed. We failed, and we chose to break his commandment. That's what happened, and we lost our holiness, okay? That doesn't sound too incredible, but here's where the incredible part comes in. Uh, Even though we made that choice, and because of that, we suffered the slavery of sin and the outcome of that is death, God could have ended the story there and let us just die. He could have destroyed everything and just wiped it all clean and just, you know, wiped his hands of it and just been done with that. But the Bible reveals the heart of God towards sinful humans, and he says in Psalm chapter 102, verse 19 and 20, he says, For he hath looked down from the heights of his sanctuary, from heaven did the Lord behold the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, and to loose those that are appointed to death. The picture that we have of the Bible, and this is why it's so incredible and why it's so beautiful, is that the holy God looked down at this, this humanity that had broken His commandments, that had violated His word and his, and his holiness, and has become unholy, and has become enslaved, and instead of just going, you know what, you guys made a bad choice, that's on you, and just destroyed it all, He looked down and had pity on us, and, and on humanity. And from the loftiness of heaven, he looks down and beholds our affliction, and he sees the groaning of us, the prisoners, humanity. We're now imprisoned to sin. We're slaves to sin. We're slaves to death. And he chooses to come help to, to release those who are appointed to death. He wants to abolish death. He wants to abolish sin in our lives and give us freedom. He wants us to return to him. We were once holy, and he wants to free us from that so that we can uh, he wants to, we were once holy and we became slaves to sin. He wants to free us from sin so that he can return us to holiness. He doesn't want us to die. That's the, the story of the scriptures, and it's beautiful. It's incredible. Second Peter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. You know, a lot of people think that God has forgotten about the promise he's made to destroy the world and to destroy wickedness, and that's what it says here. Peter is, Peter is relating that idea that God did not forget. It's not like he's, he's slacking off. It's not like he just forgot about it and it's like, I'm, I'm not going to remember what I promised way back when. God knows and he remembers. The day that he issued judgment against sin it was as good, is as good today as the day that he issued it many, many, those hundreds and uh, thousands of years ago um, as we look in the story of the scriptures. And so he hasn't forgotten. As some men might think, they are, well, God's just kind of not really going to do anything. Why is it taking so long? Because we think, oh, you know, he, he, the world should have ended by now. It should be destroyed. Why is it taking so long? Why is he never coming back? And that might cause us to doubt, and uh, it co- definitely causes the world to doubt and to, you know, propagate that idea in our mind. But <clears throat> he says the reason it is taking so long, and it's not really taking long in God's sight, but in our, from our perspective, it feels like it's taking a while. The reason is because he's long-suffering to us. He's patient. He, he is not wanting for anyone to perish. That doesn't mean that people aren't going to perish, as some people have tried to twist this verse in the Scripture to say that God doesn't want anyone to die, uh, or that, he's not, that no one is actually going to die. He doesn't want anyone to die, and He gives us time. He gives us space so that all should come to repentance. This is the main theme and the main thing that we need to know and understand about the Scripture for us 
is that God wants us to come back. He wants us not to stay in sin. He doesn't want us to be slaves to sin, but he wants to give us a path to life. He's not, he doesn't want anyone to die, and let's make that personal. He doesn't want you to die. When you think about the sins in your life, the things that you're struggling with, the things that are overcoming you, the things that you're a slave to, know this. Satan wants you to die. He wants you to stay there. God doesn't. He does not want you to die. He wants everyone to come to repentance. Um, and, and that's the thing. People have this picture of God that he's this tyrannical being just sitting in heaven from this loftiness, looking down, waiting for people to mess up so he can just throw us away. But that's not what the scriptures show us. From his loftiness, he looked down and, he's, and he decided and he's making us free instead of just letting us sit here in our slavery and go, you brought it on yourself. No, he said, I'm going to do something about it because I want you to come back. I want you to, <clears throat> to make a different choice. I want you to be free from that. And this is why the idea of repentance is so important and critical for all Christians to understand. It's, it's important for us, even as those, if, if you're a Christian, meaning you've been baptized into Christ, you've been washed from your sins, this is important for you too, because you need to know about repentance. It, it's not that once we're baptized into Christ, all our sins are forgiven from that point in everything we do going forward is just automatically covered. We have continual repentance to, to have in our lives or, or, or we're, gonna, we're going to suffer and perish. It's so important for us and this is what God wants and commands. He, he brought Christ into the world. And he brings prophets into the world and he gave us his word and his scriptures to help people return to that life and to that holiness instead of being in slavery and in death. Acts 17 verse 30, the Bible says, the times of this ignorance, God winked at. He, he's, he's overlooked that. He's letting that go, and he's, he's had a lot of patience, and he is overlooking some of those things, and he says, God winked at that. But now, he commands all men everywhere to repent. It's like he's patient, and he's patient, and he's patient. It's like, okay, the time for patience, the time, that is over. It's now time to be direct and to be assertive with everybody and tell them what they need to do. God now commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins. Because before, obviously in the law, he didn't command all men everywhere to repent, just his people and the Jews. Now, he, now it's open and available for everyone. And if we want to be his child, if we want to be a follower of God, we have to be people that are repenting. We have to be people that are willing to repent and not become hardened in our hearts, not think that we don't have the need for salvation or the need for forgiveness or the need for ongoing cleansing of the blood of Christ but need, we need to have this heart of repentance in us. And it's critical because if we don't, <clears throat> Jesus says in Luke 13, verse 3, He says, I tell you nay, but except you, like, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And um, I guess I copied and pasted a couple times, but we'll just have it there for emphasis. <laughs> it's that important. He's talking to Jews here who are looking at, these other people and said, why did they die? They're, did, were they, did they die because they're sinners or their parents were sinners? And he says, no. And these are Jews, his own people, that they thought they were the people of God. They thought they were saved. They thought they were fine. And he's telling them, no, you're not. You need to repent or you will, you will die just like those people you're asking about. We're all going to face death if we don't have a heart and a mind of repentance. We have to embrace that mindset. So <clears throat> with that, as we talk about repentance... I think the first question, obviously, naturally, is what is repentance in the first place? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, <clears throat> the concept of repentance is really quite simple uh, when you just look at the meaning of the term, when you look at the definitions of the terms. But here's a, a verse in, Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel, a couple of verses that really help us understand what the concept of repentance is. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6, God sends the prophet, and he says, Therefore say to the, to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. You see, the people had become so devoted to their idols, and they're serving their idols, and they're serving their idols, and they've left off from God. So you can imagine that they have their, back turns, their backs turned to God, and they're looking at their idols and facing their idols, and so devoted to this thing that's right in front of them, and God pleads with them and says, repent and turn yourselves away. Turn your, turn your back on those idols and now look the other way and turn to the Lord. He says, turn your faces from all your abominations. So it's literally a redirection 
from one uh, from facing one way to another, and re- that's the idea of repentance. And in this case, well, in the case of the scriptures, when we're talking about repentance, it means to turn away from things that are sinful, turn away from things that are not godly, turn away from things that are not holy, and it might literally be turning our face from abominations. But he says, turn your heart and your mind away from wickedness. And if there is a turning away of one thing, we are automatically going to be facing something else. Now, we might find in our lives that there's always some other thing to turn to. We might turn away from one thing in our life that is a problem, and we might find a whole other problem to, to become engaged in. And so there's a turning away from one thing to another, and for there to be true repentance, biblical repentance, it has to be turning away from sin, the abominations, the idolatry, and turning to righteousness. In Ezekiel chapter 18, God continues directing the people and encouraging the people and saying in in verse 27, again, when the wicked man turns away from his wickedness that he has committed, he's turned away, and now he's going to do that which is lawful and right, he will save his soul alive. And so the idea of repentance is very simple. You turn from sin, you turn away from that, and you choose instead to do what is good and what is right. And that requires... That requires, there's a bit of a process in that, and the, and the Bible reveals that to us. And so the next, we're going to talk about that process. So how do I repent? How is it that we go from facing these sins and being engaged with these sins and having our, our faces turned towards idols and, and sinful things to then turn and face righteousness and do that which is good and that which is right? Because it's a simple concept, but it really can be hard to do. It can, it can be tough. But it, I think it helps us to know what the steps are, what the process is. So let's ex- expand that. We read Ezekiel chapter 18. Let's expand around a little bit that verse and see what B- God had said to them in that verse. It, and that helps us t- maybe to understand some of this process. In Ezekiel 18, verse 27 through 31, and we're just going to read a few of those verses there. But he says again, When the wicked man turns away from his wickedness that he hath committed and does that which is lawful and right, he will save his soul alive. Because he considereth, and he turns away from all his transgressions that he's committed, and he shall surely live. Okay? And he goes on. He says in verse 31, uh, he will not die. Or in verse 28, he will not die. And he, he encourages them, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make a new heart and a new spirit. And he, and he gives them this question, why will you die? O house of Israel, the choice of what we're going to serve, which way we're going to face, what direction we're going to go in, is really up to us. And he tells the people of Israel that. He says, why are you choosing to die? They're continuing to face their idols. He says, why are you choosing to die? Turn away instead. But he says, the wicked one that does that, that turns from going one way to another, there's there's something that's going on. It's a heart change. It's a change of mind it, that, that because there's new information or there's information that we're considering and it creates a change in our heart that creates a change in our action. Those are the things that are required in order for us to repent. And it's laid out here. Um, so really the first thing he says is as far as what it takes to repent, the first thing is we have to consider our ways. We have to stop and look at our ways and, and consider is the thing that I'm doing good? Is the thing that I'm doing righteous? Not, is the thing that I'm doing favorable? I enjoy it. It might feel good, or it might help me cover something up, or hide something, or make me ignore some deeper problem. That's not the question when we're considering our ways. The, we have to be completely, just brutally honest with ourselves, and humble, and say, okay, what am I doing? And just look at it in black and white, as, as black and white as we can, and say, is what I'm doing good, or is it not? And we have to consider our ways. That's what it begins with. He says there in Ezekiel 18, the wicked man turns and saves his life and does righteousness, or he turns and does righteousness, so that saves his life because he considers. And that's where it has to start. Uh, and we have to turn and consider uh, using God's Word. That's where it begins. And that's the standard that we're comparing and considering against. It's not, hey, am I, is what I'm doing good compared to you, to my brother or my sister? 
we could get into that game and go, well, I'm considering my ways and it's better than that person. Well, then we're like the Pharisee, right? That's looking at the publican going, thank God that I'm not like that guy. And then we start looking at all our ways and say, well, I'm tithing I'm twice a week. I'm fasting. I'm doing all these things. I'm serving all these ways. And then we can make ourselves feel good by not con- considering our ways according to the right standard. So the standard has to be the Word of God. We have to look at what God defines as what is good and evil in order for us to truly know, are my actions aligned with good or are they aligned with evil? And we have to be completely open and brutally honest about that uh, with ourselves, as hard as it is, as difficult as it is. And it, it doesn't feel great. It's hard. It really is. But we have to consider our ways in light of what God has said. You know, Paul talked about this when he, when he talked about the law and the usefulness of the law uh, of Moses. And, you know, a lot of people have uh, thoughts about the law of Moses, and, and uh, Paul clears up some of those things, I think, in Romans chapter 7. But he says the law is holy, and the law is good. And what the law was designed to do is to expose people's sins, and so it gave people a standard of what is right and what is wrong, what is considered holy, what is not considered holy. And Paul said this in Romans 7, when, he, when we're talking about considering our ways, he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? No, God forbid. He says, nay, I had not known sin. I would not have known what sin was, but through the law, because the law defines what is good and what is not, what is sinful, what is not. He says, I had not known lust, except the law had said, you shall not covet. And lust in this context is not talking, necessarily talking about like a, like a, um, like a sexual thing. It's, it's just a desire for something. You covet something. You want something. He says, I wouldn't have known that that was bad, except the law told, told me and defined that and said, don't do this. And once we have a standard to consider, we have the Word of God that shows us the things that we ought to do or the things that we ought not to do, the kind of person we should be, we can look at that standard and go, okay, I'm going to consider my ways. Am I living in alignment with this or not? That's really how it begins with this process. And we have to open ourselves to that or else, or else we won't even know. We won't even know to what we need to change from or what we need to repent from. Okay? So we have to consider our ways in light of the Word of God. Now, the next thing that, that's going, that is naturally going to do when we truly open ourselves up to the Word of God and look at it and say, okay, let this shine this bright light at me so that I can really see who myself or who I actually am and decide and acknowledge whether or not I'm actually living according, according to that, it's going to produce a feeling in you. It's going to produce the, the, the sting of guilt. And I think that's part of the process. We have to feel that sting of guilt when you look at the Word of God and go, I'm falling short. I'm not living up to the standard. We're going to feel that. That is a normal thing, okay? That is a, and that is a good thing, or it can be. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 7. He, now for a bit of context, he wrote in one of the epistles about all these horrible things that were going on at Corinth. Horrible things. Men sleeping with their mother, uh, mother-in-laws or their stepmothers, rather. And he said, you're doing horrible things that aren't even named among the Gentiles. Even the Gentiles, as corrupt as they are, think that what you're doing is bad. And so if the Christians are participating in that, that's bad. If even the world thinks it's bad, that's, it's horrible. And the, our brothers, our sisters at Corinth, were doing those kinds of things. So Paul writes a letter and exposes them and gives them a standard of what is right and says, you're not living up to it. And he calls them out for that sin, and he, he wants to help them come back to, to being holy and living in righteousness. And they responded well. They responded well. And so he, in, in the rest of this context, he is praising them for the fact that they actually responded the right way. But he talks about the fact that they felt something when they read that epistle. And he says, I'm sorry. He felt bad that he had to send it and be that direct and that bold with them. But he's like, I'm not going to regret that because it made... It made It produced the right response in you, and so he was thankful for that. And so here he says and points out about this feeling that we're going to feel. In 2 Corinthians 7, he says, For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. So here he points out the feeling that we're going to have is sorrow, and we should have that and should feel that, but we need to make sure it's the right kind of sorrow. Okay, When the Word of God sheds that light on us, 
it's going to elicit one of two responses. One is the sorrow of the world. And what that is, is a type of sorrow. You're going to feel bad, but that's all. Oh, I, feel, I feel really bad. Oh, I really hate that that happened. Oh, really. And then you feel bad because you failed, or you feel bad because that's it. And it's just an emotional response, and that's it. It doesn't lead to anything but death because it doesn't lead to an actual change of our actions. Sorrow of the world gets you nowhere. Sorrow of the world makes you stay where you are, just feeling bad, stuck in your feelings, going, oh, I feel terrible. And there's nothing I can do but sit here and sulk and, be, and just feel bad, and I'm just going to stay right here and just feel bad. And I'm going to hope that because I feel bad, God is going to be okay with that. But then we don't actually produce any change in our life. We can't have that kind of repentance because it will lead to death. And some people can't even take that feeling. And, you know, you have examples like Judas who committed this horrible betrayal of Christ and he went and hanged himself. That's all over the world. It did not produce life. It produced death because he couldn't take that feeling of guilt and then actually do the right thing because of it. Instead, he just stayed stuck in that and then chose the wrong thing. Well, we have another example of that. Cain, for example. In, in Genesis chapter 4, God tells them the standard. Here's how to worship. We can, we can infer that God gave them both instruction on how to worship him properly. Here's a sacrifice that you should, you should bring. Abel, he did what God asked him to do, and he brought a great sacrifice, the sacri- kind of sacrifice God wanted, and he was accepted. God accepted his worship. And on the other hand, Cain did not, and he was rejected. And he had sorrow of the world. And we know that. Just looking at the story, he had that feeling of guilt when he was called out and God pointed out his failure. In Genesis 4, verse, verse 5, it says, But to Cain and to his offering, God did not have respect. He did not accept that, that worship. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. He just... And he felt bad. You would feel bad too if, hey, I'm worshiping God. And he, he says, no, it's not good enough. I reject that. You are not accepted. I don't have respect to your offering. You would feel horrible. We all would. And his countenance fell. And the Lord then questions him and sheds light and exposes the problem and gives him insight on what to do. The Lord said to Cain, why are you wroth? Why are you so mad, Cain? And why is your countenance fallen? If you did well, if you were doing the right thing, wouldn't I have accepted you? That's a hard question. (laughs) That stings even more, right? God is shining that light right on there. If you had done the right thing, wouldn't I have accepted you? And so the reason that God didn't accept him is because of Cain, his own actions, his own choice, yet he's not willing to accept that. He, doesn't, he is not willing to own that and say, yeah, it's because of me. You know, he blames God and, and blames his brother, but he says, if you don't do well, then sin is lying at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire that... He's personifying sin, and he says, sin is waiting at the door for you. If you're not doing the right thing, sin is waiting at the door to overtake you, and unto thee shall be his desire, and you you shall rule over him. God is giving Cain a path of how to change and how to repent and how to do the right thing. He says, if you would have done the right thing, I would have accepted you. However, you didn't, and now sin is waiting at the door. It is going to overtake you, but you need to rule over it. You need to be the master over that sin and over your heart or it is going to dominate you and destroy your life. He gives him a path, but he has a sorrow of the world. He's just mad. He's just angry. God didn't accept me. And so what does he do? He goes and takes it out on his brother and kills him. Why? Why take it out on somebody else? He should have taken it out on on his own self and said, you know what? This really hurts. This really stings. The fact that I failed God, but he's giving me a path forward, and I need to just take that path. That's what he wants from me. Not, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and sulk in my feelings and I'm just never going to do anything. I'm never going to change and I'm going to blame everybody else and I'm going to hurt other people because I'm not humble enough or I'm not mature enough to look at who has the fault and it's me. We have to know if it's me. We have to be willing to ask that question, is it me? Let godly sorrow be produced in you and not the sorrow of the world because he had a choice and he chose to stay in those feelings. Now, we have other examples of this. Uh, real quick, in 2 Kings 17, God came to his people. This is a similar kind of thing. In 2 Kings 17, 
The Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers. He sent everybody to tell them, turn away from your evil ways and instead keep my commandments and statutes according to the law that I commanded your fathers that I sent to you by my servants and prophets. He said, turn away from evil and do what I've asked you to do. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but instead they hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And what did they do because their necks were so hard? Well, just like Cain, they rejected his statutes and the covenant that he made with their fathers and their testimonies that testified against them. And they followed instead vanity and they became vain and went, went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord charged them. They should not do like them. You see what happened here? God sent them and, and called them out. And the feeling that was produced in them was the sorrow of the world. They felt angry because God called them out of their sins. They hardened their necks and they stiffened up. And it's like, you know, I just imagine when I hear, when I read about that, somebody has a stiff neck. It's like somebody just gets so tense and they're just not going to hear you. I'm not going to do what you want. I just, you've probably had interactions with people like that before, right? When you're trying to tell somebody, you're trying to maybe let somebody know how they've hurt you. They've done something and they just don't, they don't want to hear it. And they just kind of seize up. I kind of think about somebody like that. that's filled with so much pride. They harden their necks. They don't want to listen. They're done. They're done. And you're just talking to a wall. And that's what happened. They didn't want to hear God just like Cain, and so then they just went headlong into their sins and rejected God, and that is one of the responses we could have. Pride could, could make us have the sorrow of the world, and we decide we're not going to do anything about it, and instead we're just, in fact, we're just going to go further into our sins. That's pride, and that's the sorrow of the world that will lead to death. Now, the other feeling, the other response is the godly sorrow, and that's what we need. That's the, that's the the thing that we need to have produced in our life. And unlike sorrow of the world that keeps you stuck, that doesn't make you change and doesn't help you change, sorrow of the world produces uh, repentance. It produces a change of actions. It helps motivate you to take a step to do the right thing and a change in us. Uh, James chapter 1 talked about us having this willingness and the softness of heart to be able to hear and receive the Word of God and do the things that he says. In James 1, verse 19, he says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Be ready. Be quick to hear the information that God has to give to us. Not like these people who stiffen their necks and close their ears and their hearts, but instead be swift to hear. Be ready. Invite God into your... In, invite God in. Open yourselves up to hearing what the Word has to say. And, and be slow to speak. Be slow to wrath. Sometimes we're quick to justify ourselves and go, no, no, it's not really this, it's not really that. No, just be quiet and just hear what we need to hear. And be slow to wrath. Don't let wrath overtake you, the sorrow of the world, because the wrath of man works, does not produce the righteousness of God. And he says, wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, all superfluity of naughtiness. Let's put all the wicked things aside. Let's turn away from those things and receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save your souls and be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Because you could hear the word and feel bad, but if you don't actually do something about it, you're deceiving your own self. And you might think, oh, the word of God, I read it, it made me feel bad. Okay. What now? Now we have to do something. The prodigal son really captures the godly sorrow really well. You know, he left his home, he left his father, turned his back on all that was good, all that was right. He took his father's inheritance. He went and spent it on harlots and on, on all, all kinds of uh, crazy living out there to the point that he finds himself completely in poverty and completely enslaved. And he went from somebody who was with the father, and, and, and let's just put it this way, he was living holy because he was close and near to the father dwelling in his home. Now he's a slave. Now, it's a, it's a picture of our slavery to sin. And what does he do? He doesn't just feel bad. He doesn't go, oh, man, I really messed up. And then you just stay in that cycle. I really messed up. I, I really, and just stay stuck and stay stuck and stay. That's the sorrow of the world. He had the sorrow that was godly. In Luke 15, he says when he came to himself, he finally woke up and just said, what am I doing? What am I doing? Why am I doing this? He said, how many, how many hired servants... How many people does my father employ? And they have bread enough to spare. And look at me. 
I'm the son of the father and I am perishing with hunger. I'm starving and I'm, I'm, I'm homeless. I'm starving. I'm working in this field eating. I just want to eat the pig's food. And he says, wait, I don't have to do that. And his godly sorrow didn't just keep him stuck there. He made a decision to get up. He says, I will get up. I will arise and I'm going to go to my father. And I'm not just going to go to him and just expect that, well, if I just come back, he's just going to be okay. I need to tell him. I need to tell him this. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no, no more worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he arose and he came to his father. He didn't just sit there stuck going, oh, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do this. Oh, I feel really oh, I feel terrible. I feel horrible. Here's the thing I'm going to do next. And then never do it. Have you ever gotten stuck in that cycle? I, I have. It's like, oh, I shouldn't, I need to do this. And oh, I'm going to do this next. I'm going to do this next time. I'm going to do this. And it's always kind of just pushing the ball forward. That's, God, that's not godly sorrow. Godly sorrow makes us go, what am I doing? And you get up and then you do the next right thing. And so he says, I'm going to get up and go to my father. And so he actually does it. We need to take that action. That's what godly sorrow will produce in us. And so as you see here, we consider it according to the standard of God. We feel that guilt, and we have to acknowledge that we've sinned, just like he did it here. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And so that's the next part and a part of the process, is it just acknowledging that you've sinned, not just going, oh, yeah, it says that. And, but no, owning it and saying, you know what? I have sinned against God. I have sinned against you. You're my father, and I have done this thing. And, and, and be clear and be specific about that when you're going to God in your prayers and you're confessing your sins to him. Be specific and clear with it. And if it's uncomfortable, good. You have to say it. You have to tell him. In 1 John 1, 8, he says that if we say we have no sin, if we're not willing to acknowledge the sin in our life and the fact that we've done something wrong, he says we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not really in us. Isn't that, that's pretty powerful. If we pretend like we don't have an issue, we are lying to ourselves and the truth is not dwelling inside of us. But if we instead let that godly sorrow, we feel that and let that motivate us to do something, and in this case we're going to the Father and confessing our sins, I'm, I have sinned against heaven, I'm no more worthy to be called your son, here's the things that I have done. Go to him in prayer in those things, and guess what? He is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we're making him into a liar. Why? Because he said that he died for our sins. And he says that if we go to him and confess that he will forgive us our sins. But if we don't have any sins in the first place, then Jesus is lying. We're making him into a liar. And then his word is not dwelling in us. So if we want to prove him right, show that he is true, and have his word dwelling in us, then we need to have dwelling in us a godly sorrow that causes us to acknowledge our sins and go to him and say, here's what I've done. Here's the sins, and I need you to know that, and I need forgiveness. And we go to him humbly asking for, for his forgiveness. And, and we need to trust him when he says that he's going to cleanse us from that unrighteousness. Trust him. Don't, don't listen to your thoughts and your doubts and your fears and your worries and Satan's whisperings that you're just, you're just doomed to fail and you're never going to overcome. You're Believe what Jesus says. Believe what God has told you. He is faithful and just to forgive you, and He will. And He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that's a beautiful thing. And, and that's just amazing. But repentance doesn't stop there. Because we could be, oh, I feel bad, and I, now I gotta, and I'm going to confess, and I'm going to acknowledge my sins. As we've seen time and again, there's action that is involved. So we have to change then what we are doing. We can't just acknowledge the word and say, no, I'm not living up to it, and oh, I feel bad, and decide, oh, I'm going to get up and do something. We have to actually have to do that thing. Don't just go, get stuck in a cycle going, oh, I'm going to change, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, tomorrow's the day, I'm going to change. No. Actually do and change the things that you're doing. Make the changes that are necessary. Get to work. Put your work boots on. And, and get to work producing righteousness because that's the only thing that's going to actually help you to, to change. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck in this cycle of your feelings and, repent, and praying to God and expecting Him to forgive us, but we're just going to keep on doing and doing and doing and never actually changing anything. We have to be doers of the Word if we want to receive His blessings. In Acts chapter 26, verse 20, 
The Bible says that God showed first to those of Damascus and Jerusalem throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles. What did God show them and what did Jesus want us to know? That we should repent and turn to God and do works that are meet for repentance. We need to do actions, have actions that are, that are meet or that are, are worthy of repentance that actually show that we've changed and that, that we've repented. So this verse really captures that f- essence of true repentance. Consider your ways in light of God's word, and that should cause us to have godly sorrow. That's a change of heart. We're getting new information. It's causing that transformation. It changes what we do in our actions, okay? Don't just feel sorry and feel the guilt. You need to feel guilty. You need to feel ashamed. You need to feel that sting, but then do something about it. Get up and change those actions, because if you just feel sorry and never change, is that true repentance? No, it's not. True repentance comes in producing things that are different now, showing that you're different. Acts chapter 2, really quickly, in Acts chapter 2, we see this, this process play out in the day of Pentecost. So it's repentance in action. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter is gathered with the rest of the apostles. They're here with all of these, these millions of Jews that have gathered for the day of Pentecost and for these feasts. And Peter gets up and through the power of the Holy Spirit shows them and preaches to them this amazing sermon, this powerful sermon that proves that they are guilty of killing the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for. And they fought against his teaching to the point that they had him crucified. And that's what he tells them. And what, what he says as he, as, he preach, as he preaches to them, he's giving them the new information, the new standard that they should compare themselves to and their actions to. And he says in Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God made that same Jesus that you crucified. He's putting the guilt on them and shining the light and exposing their sins. He says, you have crucified them. That, that person is actually the Lord and Christ that you've been waiting for. And then we see what happens. They have the feeling of guilt. They, their hearts are convicted. Now, I think many people felt that sting, but the Bible focuses on those who decided to do something about it, and hearts were convicted. In Acts 2, verse 37, he says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, <coughs> What shall we do? They had the right response. Hearing that you killed the Messiah, your blood is on, uh, his blood is on your hands and on your head. That made him feel bad and go, oh, what do we do now? They were pricked in their heart. And so their hearts were convicted. And so then Peter calls them to repentance. And he says to them in verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the removal of those sins, the remission of those sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He tells him exactly what to do. Turn away from what you've done, and now turn to Him. You at, at one point, you were looking at Christ with hatred in your hearts and, and with joy that you murdered Him. And He says, now instead, turn to Him so that He can save you from your sins. He can cleanse you from this blood that is on your hands and on your head. He says, repent, change, and then do the right action, which is be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and He'll help you. And what was their response to hearing that information? They repented. They changed. They did the thing that God wanted them to do, and they took the action that God wanted them to take. In verse 41, it says, they that gladly received His word. You see, they didn't have a stiff neck and stiffened heart and going, I'm not hearing that. I don't want to believe. No, I'm not guilty of anything. It's not my fault that He died. He's the one that came. They didn't have all of that response and reaction. They heard that and went, oh, no. What do I do? And Peter says, here's what you do. And then they gladly received it. Just as James said, be slow to speak, slow to wrath, but receive, be ready and swift to hear, and receive with meekness that engrafted that word that is able to save your souls. That's what they did. They gladly received it and said, you know what? I'm going to hear this, what I need. And we know they gladly received it because they did that. They took the action they needed. On the same day, they were added to them about 3,000 souls. Now, there was a lot more people than 3,000 people there. And the flip side of that is that there were people who were, felt the guilt, felt that sting because they were being called out as guilty, and they didn't hear the words that Peter had to say to them. They hardened their hearts, and they were not baptized. There were people that did not gladly receive his word. They, they hardened themselves. But these people gladly received it, and they decided to be baptized. And then here's, here's the other important part about, about 
baptism, or about salvation rather than repentance. How do we know? Was it just based on this one-time action? They heard, oh, you need to repent and be baptized, so they did, and that's how we know, oh, you've changed, you've repented, you're, you're good to go. No, it didn't stop there. Because the probably one of the most important pieces of repentance, it's all important. But probably the thing that proves that is those works that are meet for repentance and this is exactly what these people showed. They showed that there was an ongoing change happening in them. They were baptized and became part of God's family. And in verse 42, it says, they continued steadfastly. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. It wasn't just a one-time, I feel bad, so I'm going to do this one thing, and I'm going to make myself, here's this one simple trick to make yourself feel better and your conscience clean. They didn't just do that and go, okay, I'm good. No. They... They were baptized into Christ, became part of his family, and then there was an ongoing change. They continued steadfastly in this new change that they had made. At one point being against God and now being in him and for him and continuing in that change. And so that's the thing that I want to uh, end with here as we talk about this process of repentance and how we repent and the importance of it. How to truly repent, I think, hinges on all of these pieces, but probably on this ongoing change. And so the last thing I want to point out is that when you've compared yourself and considered your ways, when you have seen that you're not living up to it and you've had godly sorrow and you decided, you know what, I'm not going to stay stuck here. I'm going to, I'm going to take God's invitation to get up and do something about it. And I, and I'm going to change and I'm going to, uh, make those changes in my life we have to patiently keep going in that direction. Because when you make that change, I'm going to tell you, it feels easy to kind of look back and you kind of just slowly turn and you just kind of keep slowly turning and then you feel frustrated. You feel like you're not seeing the progress. You feel like you're, you're not, you just want, in our instant gratification world, we're not seeing the results quick enough, so I need to do something to make myself feel good and make myself feel happy. And we can find ourselves not just stopping and just staying stuck and getting stuck all over again. But we need to patiently keep going. So how do we know if we've truly repented? Well, I think if we are patiently continuing on, we need to keep up and not give up. Not ever give up. Romans chapter 2, verse 7, Paul said this, to those who by patient continuance, that implies it's, it's a long process it's a hard process. It's, it's much like growing the garden. You, you have to take care and tend those plants and water those plants, and it's a long process to get to the fruit and to see the, and to see the results uh, of that. And that's your life. When you're repenting, it's, it's much like that. And you, if you have patient continuance in well-doing, and that implies it's going to be hard, we have to have patience, and we have to have endurance in doing what is good and letting those things continue to be the things that we choose. And if we do that, as we're seeking glory, we're seeking honor, we're seeking immortality, that's what we're living for. That's what God has called us to. He doesn't want us to die. He doesn't want us to be slaves to sin and death. He wants us to be free. He wants us to have life and holiness. And he says, if that's what we're looking for, and that's the primary motivation of our patient continuance, we're not patiently continuing because... We're just, we're only trying to avoid God's wrath and we're scared, we're, we're patiently continuing because there's a, there's a big goal in front of us of glory and honor and immortality. That's the goal and we keep pressing towards, towards that goal, patiently enduring. He says if we do that, we're gonna, the outcome is going to be eternal life. That's what we need. We need eternal life and so don't ever give up. I want to give a quick example of Ephesians chapter 4 of what that kind of change looks like. We go from one thing to another. Ephesians 4, we're not going to read all of this at all, but, I, but I'm going to put this up here for reference so you can check that out and read through it. But this, this passage gives us uh, really practical applications because the whole idea, in, as Paul is talking to the Ephesians, he says, put off the old way. Put off the old man. God, God saved you from, from this old life and this old way. And he says, put that thing off. You have the choice to take it off of you and he says, instead, put on the new way. Put on the new man that's renewed in knowledge 
It's renewed in your mind. It's renewed through the word of God because he shows us the standard of how to live. And then he gives practical examples. He says, if, if you were a liar before, he says, put that away from you. Stop lying. Stop being dishonest. Stop using words that are dishonest. And instead, speak the truth. You see the difference? Don't lie. Be a person that's committed to do. If you're going to put on the new way, be a person that's committed to speaking what is true, if that's a problem you have of lying. If you're a person that is angry and just has that response and you just get and you just rage out and you're He says, put that away. That does not produce the righteousness of God. He says, instead, be a person that gets over it quickly. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Be a person that is willing to let that go. If you're a person that likes to steal things, like to take things that don't belong to you, you think you deserve something, and so you're just going to get it, and you don't care about what other people, the work they've put into it, or the money they've spent on it, you just want it, and it you feels good, and you're just going to take it for yourself. Well, he says, if you're prone to that, the way you can change and put on the new man, put that off, and instead be a person that works hard and gives to others. That's what he says, labor for that which is good and give to those who are in need. That's how you can help putting, put on the new man. You're doing a whole different action. You're, you're living a whole different way. If you have a person that is prone to bad language, you're, you're saying cuss words, you're saying dirty things, you're saying evil things, you're saying you have bad language communication that's coming out of your mouth, he says change that and instead speak the things that are good. Speak things that are edifying. Choose to, to put on the new man by speaking that which is good. And he says if you have bitterness and wrath in your heart, you're just a person that clings on to things that happen, you won't let go, you're just filled with bitterness, you're filled with anger towards others, you're just not going to let it go and you're poisoning yourself with that. He says, let that go. Be a person that's like Jesus and be kind and be somebody that forgives others, even if they, you don't think they deserve it. Put those things away. He gives us a roadmap of how to put off the old man and how to put on the new man, how to put on the new way. And that's just a snapshot of that verse. There's so many other passages that deal with other problems and show us other things. But this is how we do that. And this is the patient continuance because these things, they're hard habits to break. And so you just have to keep on going and keep moving towards. Turn away, repent from evil, and turn to what is good and keep on doing those things. Don't get discouraged when you fail because patient continuance is about getting up and dusting yourself off and you keep on, keep on going. And I want to stress that to you because you, you are going to fail. You are going to have sin in your life. If you're trying to put off these things, that dead man wants to be resurrected and, and wants to come from the grave and get a hold of you and pull you down back into that, into that pit. But you've got to keep on moving forward. We have to keep moving forward, all of us. Pick yourself up. And that's why it's so important to encourage each other as we see the day of Christ approaching. Move towards that new man continually, even though you might have those failures because you will have the failures. The scriptures, the scriptures guarantee that for us and show us that. And that should give you some relief. And I want to end with this passage here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. John writes, My little children, these things I write so that you do not sin. God does not want us to sin. He does not want us to live that old life and be that old person that he saved us from. It's like going back to Egypt. He doesn't want us to be slaves again. And he says, I'm writing these things so that you won't commit sin. And if any man sin, John acknowledges and God knows and God acknowledges that we're, you're going to sin. You're going to have those moments in your life. You're going to fail. You're going to have, but there's a difference between I'm going to get up and keep going or I'm just going to fail and I'm just going to sit here and wallow in it and I'm just going to stay in my sin. I'm going to give up. If you give up, you're dead. But if you get up, you can have life. Keep going. He says, here, and here's why, and you should take great comfort in this. If any man sin, you need to know that we have an advocate with the Father. And his name is Jesus Christ. He's the righteous one. He is our advocate. And you know what this means? God knows you're going to sin, but he is on your side, and he wants you to succeed. He does not want you to fail. And so he, Jesus advocates for you. An advocate is somebody that's on your side going, get up, keep going. I'm here for you. And he's interceding on our behalf to God saying, forgive them, help them keep going. And he's going to send the things that we need and help us with the things we need and give us the word and help us to change. 
Because he, is the, he paid for our sins. He's a propitiation for our sins. And not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And, and then he says, hereby we know that we know him, that advocate. How do we know if we know the advocate that is on our side, that wants us to succeed, that wants us to keep going in patient continuance, if we keep his commandments? When you fail, that, that doesn't disqualify you from getting up and doing what is right. What does is if you choose to just sit there and not do anything about it, and you have the sorrow of the world, and you're just going to let yourself be overcome with those sins, and bitterness, and wrath, and anger at God, and all these things, and blame everybody else. But if you say, you know what? I did this. I messed this up. I'm going to Jesus because he's the one that can forgive me. He's my advocate. He's on my side. He wants me to get up, and he helps me get up, and he keeps pushing me forward, and I'm going to keep doing his commandments. Then you can have life, and that's way better. That is absolutely better. And so if you're fearful that, oh, it's just one and done and I'm disqualified from God's grace, no, you're not. If, if you just give up, yeah, you're disqualifying yourself. But he keeps that door open for us if we get up and keep going. And you need to get up and you need to keep going. And so if you need life today, if you're, if you're a Christian, um, as, as well, let's continue here. He says, if you say that you know God and you don't keep his commandments and you're lying and the truth is not in you, but whoever decides and you keep his word, in that person verily is the love of God perfected. It's a process. And hereby we know that we are in him. We can have confidence that even though we sin, we know the advocate, we keep his word, and know that we are in him. And he that says that he abides in him ought himself also to walk. So choose to walk in the word of God. And so if you need life this morning, you're a Christian, you've been baptized in Christ, but you have sin in your life, you have not truly repented, with an ongoing, lasting change in your life, we're here to pray for you and with you. And maybe you're feeling that guilt of those mistakes. We're here to pray for you for that too. Making a mistake doesn't, may not necessarily mean that you're stuck, but it could be. So you need to speak up and you need to go to the, to the Father in prayer. And we're, we're, we'll come around you and aside, on, on your side, also being advocates for you and for one another to, to go to the Father in prayer with you. We can't forgive you of your sins, but God can, and he wants to do that. And so if you need that change in your life, you can do it, and this is how we can truly repent. If you're not a Christian and you want to be baptized, you can do that too if you just humble yourself and receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save you. If you have a need, come forward this morning, and we'll pray together as we stand and we sing. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's word. If there's anything we can do to help you in your walk with Christ, send us a message at facebook.com slash cfcnwa. To find more sermons, look for us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and like our Facebook page. Thanks for listening, and God bless.